This particular video is about mechanism of injury. My name is Dan Limmer from Limmer Education. Uh, mechanism of injury is one of the early parts of the trauma assessment, but one that's just so important. It gives us information that helps us throughout the call. Let's take a look at how the mechanism of injury uh, really helps us in trauma assessment. Now, I'll start by saying that mechanism of injury is not guaranteed. If someone has a mechanism of injury, they may be more injured, but they may not be more injured. Nonetheless, it's part of the information that we get that forms that index of suspicion and an important part of our scene size up. Remember scene safety, our BSI, uh, any hazards uh, we have to deal with, any resources we need, the number of patients, and in trauma, it's the mechanism of injury. Now I look at mechanism of injury as having three main branches that come off of it, three decisions, three points that mechanism of injury gives us as we move forward into other parts of the patient assessment. And you can see those on the screen now. One, is this injury isolated or is it multiple trauma? And if it's multiple trauma, how much do I need to look for those hidden or multiple injuries? Secondly, what's the potential for severity, right? We don't need to wait for our primary assessment or our vital signs to tell if there's a potential for severity. If we look at the mechanism of injury, we're going to have a pretty good sense of whether we're going to be going fast or slow. And of course, that can change in the primary assessment. And then finally, the mechanism of injury um, tells us um, about the need for spinal precautions. Now, of course, spinal precautions now are spinal motion restriction. But that doesn't mean at this early stage that we're not going to consider uh, C-spine stabilization, eventually uh, a C-collar, and then do some type of assessment for spinal motion restriction as we go on. Now, to illustrate this, uh, we've put together two patients, a patient that has an apparent isolated injury and a patient that has a more potentially serious injury. So let's take a look. So the first example um, is a 45-year-old male. He misstepped. He twisted his ankle on the curb. Now, these calls are you know, much more common than um, the multiple traumas are, so it's very important that we, we think about these because this is really what we see. So now we take this and we say, all right, so the first part of our scene size up. All right, seem good for safety. No issues uh, as far as hazards. Resources, nope. You know, one patient looks good, and BSI right now we're wearing gloves, of course, depending on uh, COVID and other things, we may decide um, that a mask is uh, appropriate on more calls than we did before, right? So this 45-year-old uh, guy misstepped, twist his ankle on the curb. So now we're going to go over and say, is this isolated or multiple trauma? Well, he has a complaint of a twisted ankle, okay? That sounds kind of like isolated um, injury. However, um, if he did fall, we should really make sure he didn't strike his head, make sure he didn't have an outstretched arm. We should just consider those things, especially because if he has a very serious, um, say, an ankle fracture and a lot of pain, he may have an injury somewhere else, but it's really being masked by that pain. So we're going to think about it a little bit more, but we're going to say this is probably isolated. Potential for severity? Yeah, probably not a need to, to scoot to the trauma center on this one. And spinal precautions for this isolated injury are probably much less likely. Now, let's go on and take this into the more serious patient. And I hope that you're seeing uh, what this size up does for us. Um, if you're an experienced EMT, you've probably been through this or you've learned this. If you are uh, in uh, EMT class, if you are um, a new EMT, you might not have realized how important these things are and how they come together, that this really helps you make decisions as the call goes on. Now, uh, here's our second case. A uh, man shot in a bar fight, uh, screaming uh, about pain, and he's holding his thigh. All right, so let's look at our size up. All right, we have police on the scene. We don't believe we have any current hazards, although with a bar fight and people shot, we're always gonna be careful. All right, so we have no issues. But we have gloves and uh, face protection simply because there could be some splashing uh, blood here. And it looks like we have one patient. So now we're going to our mechanism. All right, he's shot and he's screaming and holding his thigh. First of all, your first observation, the fact that he's screaming is better than having him quiet, right, when it comes to a status. But isolated or multiple trauma, well, here we go, the same kind of thing again. Um, he says he's shot in the thigh. That's the one that hurts. 
But boy, you don't want to, you know, get to the hospital, have him start cutting the clothes off and find a hole in his chest or his back or even his arm, any place have another wound. So when you have something like this, you've really got to start thinking a little bit more of a global level. Even when bullets go in, they take weird turns. Um, is there an entry wound and an exit wound? And where that goes is obviously very important. Now, our potential for severity really does kind of um, hit uh, pretty seriously for us here um, because bleeding and shock, you know, a thigh wound, uh, we're not saying a leg, we're saying thigh. Um, the vascular, the large uh, arteries are coming down to, to feed the leg there, depending on, on where it is. Anything from the femoral to the popliteal arteries coming through, uh, we have the potential for bleeding. So this is clearly um, a fast track situation with pressure, possibly a, a tourniquet if it's required. Um, and we should be saying to ourselves for our ABCs, um, our C, our circulation, our bleeding control comes first. And then spinal precautions. Listen, if this is penetrating trauma, spinal precautions are not necessary, right? That's a pretty important thing here. And it's uh, it's been put out uh, in PHTLS. The American College of Surgeons position paper on spinal motion restriction is very clear. Um, if we're waste, if we're spending time collaring and meticulously backboarding somebody, it's time they could be headed for a surgeon. And the chance of spine injuries are profoundly low. So what we're doing is we're not doing spinal precautions. Our mechanism says penetrating trauma. We need to know that in penetrating trauma, we don't worry about that. What do we do? We need to get them moving. We need to stop that bleeding, um, make sure there's no other injuries, do a primary assessment and get them moving. But how do we get into the primary assessment and make decisions? Well, in this case, the mechanism of injury really is our bridge for that. Now, this will be a downloadable uh, file for you. Uh, for the last slide here, we've put some vital signs, references, um, the Glasgow Coma Scale. The newer versions uh, and updates in the Glasgow Coma Scale um, actually have a new section called NT, not testable. Somebody has a, a trach and they can't have a verbal response. There's actually now a not testable uh, part of this. And we know that there are certain uh, striations in Glasgow Coma um, Scale uh, things in mild, moderate, and severe, eight or less, is generally considered a coma. So it's just good really to know those for trauma. And we just put this up here um, for your information. I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to this. Uh, trauma is, uh, is a big thing. And uh, how you get through the door um, from the approach to the patient and make good decisions going into the scene size up uh, depends on a solid evaluation of all the elements in the scene size up, but especially the mechanism of injury. Hope you enjoyed this. This is Dan Limmer for Limmer Education. Thanks for listening.